people ask me what I do, is this working? Yeah. Um, I tell them that I'm a molecular animator. And what this means in practice is that I spend way too much time in front of a computer screen trying to wrangle molecules into doing on the screen what biologists think they're doing in cells. It sounds kind of like a strange job, I know. So I thought I might tell you a little bit more about how I became a molecular animator and why I do what I do. So in graduate school, while I was working towards a PhD in cell biology, I studied how cells crawl. So this is a movie of a crawling cell that was taken back in the 1950s. This is very famous in certain scientific circles. And it shows a neutrophil, an immune cell, that's crawling after a bacterium. And I know it's, it's a very dramatic movie. It's very exciting. You might be worried here that there's not a happy ending, but there is one. The bad guy gets caught at the end, as you can see here. So whether you're a biologist or not, I think this movie brings up a lot of really interesting questions. For example, we know the cell doesn't have eyes. How does it know where the bacteria is in front of it? How is it able to change direction like that? And what's going on inside the cell that allows it to crawl in this way? So in graduate, in graduate school, I spent most of my time caring for cells and looking at them under microscopes. So this image, which I didn't take, um, shows you the types of structures that I looked at under the microscope. It's pretty amazing, isn't it? So if we take a closer look at some of this, uh, these, the, what we have here is basically a cell, cells that have been fluorescently labeled, where the proteins of interest have been um, labeled with a fluorophore so that we can see them. If these cells were alive, then we would be able to see that these, these networks that we see here are constantly being taken apart and rebuilt. And it's all incredibly dynamic. But of course, we can't just peel back the cell membrane and take a look at what's going on inside there. Molecules in the cell are generally smaller than the wavelength of light. So we can't really see them directly. We can use indirect methods, such as the fluorescent, fluorescent labeling that you see here, to be able to get an idea of where the proteins are in the cell and what kind of larger structures they make, and also, if it's a live cell, how they might move around. But we can't actually see what the proteins look like. What are the shapes and sizes of these molecules? For that, we have to turn to other fields in biology, such as structural biology, where you can use techniques such as x-ray crystallography to look at the shapes and sizes of individual proteins down to where each atom is in three-dimensional space. So in my research, I was particularly interested in studying these networks here that are, look kind of like spiders' webs. Um, and using structural biology techniques, we know that these structures are actually built of proteins that look like this. This protein is called actin, and these networks that are built here are actin networks. And so you, we can t also know from structural biology that they form long filaments, as shown on the left. So really what crystallography is providing us is a sort of like a still image, a sort of a snapshot of what a protein looks like in three-dimensional space, but it doesn't actually tell us what the function is within the cell. And for that, we have to use other fields, such as biochemistry, that gives us information about how two different proteins may interact with each other and what kind of reactions they can carry out. Using genetics, we can also figure out things about what the role of the protein is within a cell. So for example, if we got rid of a protein within a cell, is a cell still able to crawl? Does it crawl slower? Does it crawl faster? And so I think of this as kind of just a lot of different clues. Using all of these different types of experimental techniques, we start getting clues about the bigger picture, and we can start building a mental model or a hypothesis about how a process works. And I think of this a little bit about, like, kind of like it's trying to rebuild a crime scene in CSI, where you have a lot of little bits of information, and you're trying to tell a compelling story from all of those bits. So for example, we might have a motive in this case. We might have some snapshots, some still images, we might have a record of some interactions, and we also may even have a video showing different types of movements that have undergone. And so it's really up to us to take all of these types of data and try to incorporate them into this story, into a hypothesis. One of the ways that a cell biologist, a biologist may be able to start creating this hypothesis is using a paper and a pencil, which I think is a great way to start. So we can start by showing one protein as a circle, maybe another one as a square, and show them coming together. And then we can start drawing some more of the complex structures that we think they make inside the cell. But you, you can see that this type of illustration doesn't even begin to capture the type of information that we actually have in biology. What about showing what proteins actually look like in 3D space, or showing how they move in the cell, or showing the crowdedness within the cell? 
You might be surprised to know that this type of illustration is about as far as most biologists get in terms of visualizing their molecular hypotheses. It's actually the lack of molecular visualization software within science that made me turn to commercial animation software while I was a graduate student in order to visualize my own molecular hypotheses. And I'm extremely lucky in that I received a lot of support to do this. I'll always be grateful to my graduate advisor for allowing me to take time away from the lab and away from my experiments, a considerable amount of time, in order to take my first animation courses while I was working towards my PhD. So with the first few courses, animation courses under my belt, I started working with my lab to visualize our hypotheses of what, uh, what kind of processes that we were studying. Um, so these were all done in collaboration. Um, some of these are my own. So this, for example, is an illustration that I created of the actin networks at the leading edge of that crawling cell. And what I tried to really capture here is the three-dimensional shapes of proteins, the kind of larger structures that they made, along with structures with other proteins, and also the kind of crowdedness in the cell that exists, that we thought exists in this, in this portion. Animation software, I found it extremely complicated. I found it really difficult to use. It was just seemed, especially the software I was using at the time, seemed rife with bugs. It was really, it took me a long time to do anything, even this very simple animation you see behind me but I loved it. And the reason I loved it was that all of a sudden I had this power to take an idea, an idea that just existed maybe as a stick figure drawing on a piece of paper. I could bring it to life now in time and space the way that you envisioned it inside your head. And this seemed incredibly powerful to me. So working together with my lab mates, I also realized that these animations weren't just great for communicating an idea to people, but it was also a really great means of being able to really explore a hypothesis by having this type of tool that now you could explore things in 3D in a way that we just didn't have the ability to do before. So I became really fixated on this idea of becoming a molecular animator, of trying to use animation as a means to allow other researchers to communicate better and to share their ideas with others. So my next step, as is often the case for a newly minted PhD in biology, was to look for a postdoctoral position. And what I wanted most in the world, of course, was to find a postdoc where I would be able to focus on creating molecular animations. And this is basically unheard of. Uh, there was really no fellowships out there that I had seen that would allow me to do this, but I did find one. And I was incredibly lucky to, to have gotten a, a postdoctoral fellowship from the National Science Foundation to do animation. And I just felt like I had won the lottery. And so for this postdoc, the first thing that I did was I hopped on a plane and I flew to Hollywood, where I spent three months learning the, basically the industry standard for, molecular, for animation, for 3D animation. The class that I took uh, was, there was probably like eight people there. I was the only woman, and I was the oldest at the ripe age of 27. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, and, and in these classes, what we learned, I modeled spaceships and I animated fireworks. And all the time, I was just thinking about how I could use these very same techniques to model cells and animate molecules. So I landed, when I got back into Boston, I started creating these animations. And these were animations of the origins of life in collaboration with the Shostak Lab um, at, at Mass General Hospital and the Museum of Science in Boston. So I'll show you a couple of these animations, um, but I think yeah, I'm not gonna have a lot of time to go into depth about them. So if you're interested in learning, about more, learning more about them, then I encourage you to take a look at the website. Uh, it's called exploringorigins.org. So a number of animations focused on RNA and how RNA is able to both hold genetic information as well as catalyze chemical reactions. And the way it's able to catalyze chemical reactions is by folding into a three-dimensional shape. This three-dimensional shape is mediated by the same types of base pairing interactions that hold DNA together in a double strand. And so this is kind of a, sort of a quasi simulation of showing how RNA might fold. A lot of other visualizations focused on another type of molecule called fatty acids, which are thought to have formed the very early membranes of these early cells or protocells. So what this animation shows is a nucleotide, which is shown kind of the blue and gray blobby guys flying around, um, and a vesicle shown in cross-section. So the nucleotide interacts with some of the head groups of these fatty acids. The fatty acids are able to flip-flop between the two leaflets of the membrane and thereby allow the, the nucleotide to enter this vesicle. So towards the, um, after I finished up my postdoc, I was really beginning to miss 
where I came from, my roots, which was cell biology and biochemistry. And so I started a position at Harvard Medical School where I did a number of collaborations with researchers in the cell biology department. One of, the favorite, one of my favorite ones so far has been a collaboration with a researcher named Tom Kirkhausen who works on the process known as clathrin-mediated endocytosis. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and show you this animation and I'll kind of walk you through it. So we're starting here outside of the cell and now we're looking inside. And what you can start seeing here are these three-legged proteins known as clathrin, which can self-assemble into these soccer ball-like shapes. There's interactions also with the membrane here that it's allowing the membrane to basically form this cup shape and then form this sort of a vesicle. So it's kind of forming a bubble. And inside this bubble are proteins that were originally outside of the cell. Now you see fission happening here by means of these purple proteins. And now a bunch of yellow and orange proteins are coming in. And these proteins are involved in recycling the protein. So basically, they're going to force this entire uh, lattice to come apart. And so now what happens is clathrin and all those other proteins get recycled uh, back to the cell membrane where they can do all of this over again. So this is a typical type of illustration that a biologist might create. And I think this is actually a pretty, I made it myself. It's a pretty good example <laughs> of a type of illustration a biologist might make to show the exact process that I just showed you of clathrin-mediated endocytosis. So I think there's a lot of reasons you might want to have a simplified illustration like this. I think it can play an important role in a lot of different types of areas. But I think within biology in particular, you re we really have to start using different techniques that can actually capture the data that we have. All of the information about protein sizes and shapes and how they move in the cell, how crowded the cell is, um, in order to really start asking better questions. So I think you know, armed with these sort of, what I consider them to be a molecular, a visual molecular hypothesis, I think researchers can ask better questions, design better experiments, and also share their ideas with their colleagues as well as with the public. So one of the things that I really love about being in the field that I'm in is that it combines a lot of different areas. So I'm involved in scientific and medical research, of course, as well as in the kind of the growing more into the art and design sphere. Um, and so one of the things I think about a lot being at this sort of intersection is how to do better outreach. As a biologist, um, how do we get more people interested in the type of research that molecular biologists are doing, particularly thinking about the fact that most of the research, pretty much all of it, is all funded by tax dollars. So as a molecular biologist, I'm really jealous of astronomers. Since humans have existed, we've peered out into the night sky and been totally just awed and, and curious and amazed by what we see. You don't have to be an astronomer to appreciate the beauty of outer space or to get excited about the images that we get sent back from Mars rovers. In fact, a lot of you probably have <laughs> lots of images of distant galaxies <laughs> as the default screensaver or the backgrounds on your computers or your phones. I think it would be amazing if the images of cells and molecules took this kind of place in our lives of amazement, of awe, of curiosity. I think there are just tons of beautiful images being created and collected from things like light microscopes where we have here fluorescently labeled cells from the brain of a rat to beautiful watercolor paintings. These were done by David Goodsell at the Scripps Institute where he creates these, these watercolor paintings that are molecularly and scientifically accurate depictions of these, these beautiful things. And he does things of cells, viruses, um, very gorgeous. And of course, there are people like me who are creating these animations um, who are, and are trying to convey some of the exciting things that I think are going on at the molecular cellular levels all the times in all of our cells. So I encourage you to take a look at some of these images. One great place to start is the Cell Image Library, which has a lot of the images that I showed you today. And I think if you took the time to explore it, you'll find that these, the universe within our cells and at the level of the molecules are, can be just as amazing, as awe-inspiring, and as mind-boggling as the universe out there. Thank you. Thank you.